Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Hello, friend. Delling Poll here, James Delling Poll, introducing the Delling Poll podcast brought to you by Breitbart and Podcast One. Now, in this week's episode, before I introduce my special guest, I want to let you into an exciting secret about myself. Well, I say exciting, not that exciting, but it is quite interesting. I want to tell you about my special superpower. No, I can't see through walls, I'm not bulletproof, I can't I can't turn base metal into gold, bloody useful though that might be, but it is quite useful this skill in my profession. What it is, I have the rare ability to churn out, no sorry, turn out I should say, an immaculately written, brilliantly incisive, witty, thoughtful, eight or nine hundred word essay without going through any planning. I can just splurge it out just like that. How did I acquire this modest superpower? Well, I'll tell you. Basically, I am a completely lazy-assed bastard. I never enjoyed planning essays at school. I always used to think it was really boring when the teachers say, well, you've got to plan first, spend the first 10 minutes of your exam reading the question and thinking, planning your answer. No, I never wanted to do that. I wanted the superpower where I could just write it from out of my head onto the page. And that is the skill I've acquired over the years through through practice. And now it comes instinctively. Why am I telling you this mildly fascinating fact. I'll tell you. It's because for the last few episodes of Delling Pole, the Delling Pole podcast, I've laboriously scripted the bit beforehand and then read it out in little little nuggets. And I found it a real pain in the ass because uh, it, it feels like work. It feels not natural. So this time I thought I'd just completely ad lib and obviously there'd be some ums and ahs, but hey, I'm doing it. I'm freewheeling and this is it. Anyway, on to my special guest this week. Her name is Isabel Oakshot, and she is one of my favourite political journalists. The reason I like her is when I've seen her on BBC shows like Any Questions, she tells it like it is. She she talks like a normal person. She doesn't sort of she doesn't give the impression of second guessing her answers or adjusting them for the politically correct mores of our of our time. She just says what she thinks, and this reflect this is reflected in her journalism, and uh, in the excellent books she's written. One of which is a an unauthorized biography, which she co-wrote with Lord a- Lord Ashcroft, an unauthorized biography of our former Prime Minister David Cameron. The book was called Call Me Dave. And I was actually in the book. I was such a fan of Isabel's from from the TV that when she emailed me to say, did I have any childhood recollections of the Prime Minister? I wonder what she could have meant by that. I said, well, well, Isabel, come round to my house and sit on 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 the lawn and we'll talk about it. So Isabel came round to my house. I think this was the first time I had ever met her. And she asked me about my time at Oxford with with Dave. And, of course, it was a a, a fairly open secret among journalists, at least, that I had smoked drugs with David Cameron. We just rolled spliffs and listened to Supertramp albums. And Isabel said to me, are you sure you're happy for this information to go in the book? And I said, well, you know... (laughs) I didn't actually say nobody's going to read it, but that was kind of how I felt. I'm 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 very irresponsible, and um, I'm the sort of person who just does things on a whim. And I just thought, I like you, Isabel. I'm going to give you this information for free. I could have saved it for my own my own autobiography, but by then, David Dave's not going to be be prime minister, and no one will care who he is or what he did at Oxford. So, I'm going to give this bit of information with love to you. So that's exactly what I did. And, of course, the next thing I knew, uh, many months later when the book came out, suddenly 
I'm on the front page of the Daily Mail as the person, the first person in history to go on the record about having smoked drugs with the, with the Prime Minister, with any Prime Minister. I mean, it's just marijuana, for heaven's sake. It's no biggie. That was another of the reasons why I divulged the information. I thought, who cares if Dave smoked marijuana? Actually, it probably redounds to his credit. It gives him a bit of street cred. Anyway, I'd made my bed. I lay in it. I suffered for about five days at the hands of the press. I got sort of slightly monstered, rejected at least briefly by some of my friends. But I came out of it because I was brave and I I really didn't care. Anyway, without further ado, let me introduce to you my special guest, Isabel Oakshot. I am really excited today by my special guest, Isabel Oakshot. Now, I... Before I met Isabel, I had admired her for a long time from afar. In fact, she's on on, on my list of second and third wives. Um, there, are, there are various women in the media who are sound, libertarian, right women who are actually better at it than any man I could name. And Isabel is one of them. Um, you, you're brilliant on programmes like Question Time. And then... One day you approached me, didn't you, about a, a book project you were doing and you helped completely ruin my reputation and my career. Tell us about that, Isabel. Well, James, I, I love the flattering introduction. And as you know, when you're a sort of right of centre commentator in Britain, most of the time you're just being bashed. So it's quite nice to have some warm words. Do you get hate? I get hate all the time. I do. And in fact, my hatred towards me began at about 7.30 this morning, I think, on Twitter. And I had to remind somebody that this is December the 2nd or whatever it is, December the 3rd even, I don't know, but it's Advent, it's a lovely day, you know, and it's a, it's a rough old thing if you start the day abusing people on Twitter. I'll bet that you don't play the misogyny card there, do you? Uh, unlike, unlike so many women on the left. If you attack a woman on the left, it's always misogyny. I don't think I've ever uh, publicly played the misogyny card. I do think that the reaction to some of the things I say and some of the positions I've taken has been, uh, to some extent, shaped by the fact that I'm a woman and there are very few female political commentators and even fewer uh, voices on the right. Uh, But I, I accept the status quo and don't like to harp on about that kind of stuff. Now, we're going to talk briefly, before we get out of the way, about your book, Dave, the one that, in which I was, I was publicly humiliated. You were not publicly humiliated. I think that you, you came out of that all very well. Do you think I did? We're talking, we're talking about Isabel's bi- unofficial biography of the former Prime Minister, almost a, a piece of hist- a footnote in history now, David Cameron. But the book was called Dave, and it did pretty well, didn't it? It caused, it caused quite a... a a, a kerfuffle, including the revelation that I had once partaken of the weed with the Prime Minister? Well, I think uh, there is no author or co-author as I was, because this was very much a collaboration with Michael Ashcroft, Lord Ashcroft, who's an international businessman and philanthropist who uh, was very keen on uh, working with me on this biography of, of David Cameron. I don't think any uh, author or co-author of a project like that could possibly find cause for complaint when they got global publicity for their book. Uh, You're talking about me? Uh, well, no, you, you you may have got um, global publicity, but actually the book is really what I was talking about. Oh, right, sorry. Um, and, you know, yes, it caused an absolute storm. And, uh, you know, we're sitting here this morning in the heart of what used to be David Cameron's former constituency. I happen to live couple of miles down the road from where our former prime minister used to live and if somebody had said to me this time last year a year from now David Cameron will be gone and his entire legacy will be in tatters I would have been absolutely stunned by that I'm I'm totally with you on that it's, it's unreal about how much he's he's vanished And, you know, one thing that I've observed is that I've seen a number of prime ministers come and go. And there's usually a period after political leaders come and go. There's usually a period a short while after the honeymoon period of the of the new leader uh, where everybody says, oh, gosh, I wish actually, you know, all's forgiven. Come back, David Cameron or come back, Ed Miliband. You know, come back, Ed Miliband was quite a theme after Jeremy Corbyn got in. I've not heard anybody saying, can we have David Cameron back? Not no, yet. I mean, maybe weed. this is early days, but, you know, it's an absolute comprehensive trashing of whatever legacy the man may have hoped to have. You know, it's it's all will be forgotten. He may get some credit 
for having been the first uh, successful, if you like, leader of a, a coalition since the war, a stable coalition between 2010 and 2015 in this country, um, and possibly a bit of credit for not leading the country, in some people's views, to worse economic peril than it was in uh, pre-2010. But beyond that, all he's ever going to be remembered for is accidentally taking Britain out of the EU, if indeed we do come out. I'm sure we'll come to that. I, I was about to joke that he didn't start a war, but then I, I realised actually he was behind the the, the assault on, on, on Libya, which has created... Yes, the... indeed. And, you know, Cameron wanted a good war. I think he was, as, a, as somebody who was very well educated, quite aware that every leader... Can, it's a good thing Galtieri, for, Hitler. to have a good war. Uh, perhaps these days are rather more difficult to do that. But he was very gung-ho going into Libya. And it seemed as if it had sort of gone quite well initially. But that has become a characteristic of our uh, recent interventions militarily, that they, that they seem to be quite good at the beginning and then it quite quickly unravels. When you were writing the book, when you were researching the book, to which I, of course, contributed with my university revelations, did it, did it strike you, why the hell am I writing a biography of this complete loser? Were you, were you conscious at the time of, of, of how poor his record was so far? Actually, you know, I approached it with an open mind. I genuinely did. Uh, I have probably become a little bit more uh, right wing as the years have gone by. Perhaps yes. that happens to all of us. But I certainly didn't approach this uh, project from the point of view of somebody who was hostile to David Cameron or a particular critic of David Cameron. In fact, my relationship, such as it was, a professional relationship with Cameron was perfectly cordial. Uh, so I thought, I, you know, I, like any investigative journalist, I will just take it as I find it. And in fact, the book is not that hostile to David Cameron. No, no, it's not. No, no, I'm absolutely. I think I think you give him a perfectly fair hearing. I just think it's it's weird. If, name a prime minister. Well, OK, as you can, Gordon Brown. But name a prime minister who was. How long was he in power? Eight years? Cameron came in in 2010 and left, as we know, uh, earlier this year. So, 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 so six, six yeah. years. But that was six years of pretty much, pretty much nothing. But look, let's not dwell on Cameron anymore. He ain't worth it. Um, we, let's segue on to the new regime. Because Theresa May, she wasn't, obviously, she, she wasn't elected for the, for, the, for the post. She just sort of slipped into it. How... Um, is she doing so far? I'm disappointed, I have to say. Well, James, I think you're far too easily disappointed. I think yes. that you you had psyched yourself up to be disappointed and it was going to take, a, frankly, a miracle for you not to be disappointed. I was very worried, I don't mind saying, uh, when it looked like Theresa was going to win. I uh, backed... In, so I'm not actually a member of the Conservative Party, but I thought that Andrea led some... Uh, who was very much on the Brexit side of the referendum campaign, was the kind of leader we could really trust to deliver the outcome of the referendum, to get us and, out of, of the EU. So, and yet she was the victim of a... Tr I, I've never seen such a vicious campaign conducted, I think, against any politician than the one that was conducted I against, against her. I thought it was repellent. I was in touch with Andrea informally over that period. I don't know her very well, but I've known her for a number of years. And I thought that what happened to her over the relatively anodyne, frankly, comments that she made what about she the say? importance of motherhood. So this will have been a sideshow that many people who are not political anoraks like us will have, will have really rather missed, particularly if you're not living in Britain. Uh, or the Westminster Village, but Andrea Leadsom, who was very much the outsider coming into the leadership battle created by David Cameron's shock exit, she gave an interview to the Times newspaper in which she talked about how important it was to her being a mother and how this gave her a different outlook on the world. And this was swiftly spun up by her very clever enemies, political enemies, into being a personal attack on her main rival at that time, Theresa May, who is, of course, unfortunately childless. 
And actually, if you looked at the comments, I could not imagine that anyone, uh, really anyone, would make that kind of personal attack on another woman who's been unable to have children. But knowing Andrea as I do, I know that she spoke from the heart and it was all about how she felt and her perspective on life, not an attack on another woman for not being able to have children. But you can imagine how... Um, excitable everybody got about this story and how vicious then the backlash was against her and I thought it was actually very disappointing that she didn't style it out I think she should have held her head up and kept going one thing I've learned from many years of observing uh, these types of furoras is actually you can just brazen it out and you know the narrative moves on after a few days it's a horrible place to be in the middle of a circus like that but if you just keep going, you can style it out and you can pick yourself up and you can still be the winner. And I think I still believe she could have won. Who do you think was coordinating this campaign? And it was obviously coordinated in league with the newspapers, wasn't it? I mean, there were quite a few newspapers which wanted Theresa, the kind of reincarnation of Margaret Thatcher, as they styled her, to, to, to win. They didn't want... Well, I don't want to get too conspiratorial about this, but I could make two observations, one of which is that the initial story ran in The Times. Now, The Times is very pro-Remain and uh, has been vehemently so since since the uh, referendum outcome. The Times has run an extraordinary campaign to uh, print the worst possible uh, perspective on all the economic news and sort of try to convince us all it's a kind of continuation of what we called project fear in the run-up to the referendum itself so first of all the times i think had an agenda uh, not to have a hard brexiteer in number 10 Uh, and secondly i would say that andrea ledson was hopelessly ill-advised she didn't have a proper media operation she was surprisingly resistant to having professional people around her And that left her flailing around and she's very inexperienced. And, you know, I I remember uh, messaging her in the middle of all this before she stepped down saying, now, listen, just a piece of friendly advice privately. uh, Do not from now on speak about your weight. Do not speak about your health. Do not speak about anything to do with anything personal, because you talk about what you do to keep fit and it will be seen as a slight on Theresa May. You talk about what shape you're in and somebody will say, oh, she's having a bitch at the Theresa May because she's thinner or fatter or, you know, no good could you come You girls, eh? Well, <laughs> so there are people like that. I know, afraid. it's appalling. Isn't Actually, it? Actually, you know what, though? The people that are spinning those stories and making it out to be women fighting women are usually men. Right, yeah, good point. Okay. They like a cat fight. It's our, we know it's our fault, really. We always know it's our fault. The... Isn't it sad, though, that having won this spectacular victory for Britain, for the things that we believe in, for for liberty, for sovereignty, for limited government, we hope, we ended up getting by far the worst of the of the potential candidates? I mean, I mean, I, well, I'm not sure about Boris, but Gove would have been a fantastic prime minister, I think. Okay, you're 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 I'm making, wrinkling my nose. You're wrinkling your nose, which is a skeptical look. But I would have been. I think. I think that Andrea Ledson would have been fantastic. Theresa May, not so much. And and even if you discount Brexit, what she has been doing so far indicates to me that she is big government. She is is high tax. She is not the not the the, the classical liberal dream prime minister we might have hoped for. I think you're too easily and quickly disappointed. I think that, uh, like you, I was uh, concerned when she became the front runner. She has an abysmal record uh, on immigration, which, after all, was at the absolute heart of why we want to leave the EU. And when I say we, I mean the 17.4 million people who gave the biggest democratic mandate for a cause in this in the history of this country. So I, I, I was worried about it, but she has embraced Brexit. Her whole prime ministerial reign is com- contingent on delivering Brexit, no doubt about that. She has absolutely staked her career on it. And I think she will do everything in her power to deliver it. 
the difficulty I have with it at the moment is, and it's a, it's a common theme around Westminster at the moment, is we just don't know enough about what the strategy is. And into that vacuum, uh, you know, political journalism absolutely abhors a, back, a vacuum. And so all sorts of other narratives and agendas are creeping in. So we don't at the moment have a leader who is shaping the narrative. I think we should talk about that in, in more detail in the next section because it's worrying me a lot, the, the, this idea that having won the battle, we're about to lose the war. So you can give me the, the Westminster inside goss on that. You are listening to Delling Poll on Podcast One. OK, face it, you love to binge, you know, on good stuff like cookies, spicy chips, TV shows and, of course, podcasts. Well, that's exactly why Thrilling Tales, the podcast, releases every chapter of its amazing stories on Mondays. So you can binge on the whole thing. So if you need something else to binge on or just something totally entertaining, get Thrilling Tales, the podcast now on the Podcast One app, iTunes or at PodcastOne.com. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling You are listening to Delling Poll on Podcast One. Welcome back to my special guest, Isabel Oakshot. So we've had our chocolate digestive break, and now we're going to go back onto the subject of what we're going to talk about. With Isabel we're Oakshot. We're going to talk about whether Theresa May is a disappointment already, and I was saying that I just think it's far too early to say that she's. Yeah, you only said. Can I just say you only said that in order to disagree with me? Had I said she's been fantastic, you would have pointed out all the. For example, what about what about their attitudes towards tax and stuff, and 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 having citizen citizens on the board of companies to stop the the directors getting it getting top whack? I mean, this seems to me very kind of unconservative. This kind of meddling in the market, and particularly at a time when we post a referendum, need to, to be creating a global image as a place where the rich and uh, successful should be congregating and bringing their companies here and let's make Britain a kind of Singapore on steroids yeah. I think it sends out rather the wrong message to be talking about uh, giving workers uh, more rights on boards uh, you know uh, limiting executive pay look no, I find it as distasteful as everybody else when a chief executive is earning a ridiculous multiple of uh, what the average worker in a company is earning. But I'm not sure that kind of legislating is the way to go about this. These things have a way of shaking themselves down and working themselves out. I mean, look at the price reputationally that so-called Sir Philip Green, uh, former boss of... Uh, companies that he'd rather not be boss of anymore has got himself into you know the reputational damage that he has suffered as a result of what's perceived to be very unethical dealings uh, with BHS the company that he owned yeah it it, did, it doesn't need government the the public humiliation is 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 quite enough and that's how that's how freedom works that's probably my position, uh, but I think that I'm rather in a minority on this one. You know that it's quite difficult to argue for a sort of against the moral case for uh, government at least pressurising uh, or, or sending out the sort of important signals that chief executive pay should be kept within some kind of reasonable limits. The problem is if you believe in the market, then meddling around with it in that way doesn't sit very easily. Where do you sense this is all coming from? Because you've got, OK, you've got the Chancellor, who I believe was a successful businessman at one stage. So he's, he's worked in the markets, he understands how the, the profit motive and stuff. And then you've got Theresa May, whose husband is a, a banker, runs, runs a fund, doesn't he? So he must understand how profits and stuff work. Is this just a sop to the ignorant masses? Is it just like, like I feel your pain, therefore I'm going to do this stuff? I think part of what's going on here is a desire, quite understandable desire on the part of Theresa May, to have some kind of other legacy. And it, oh, sorry, it's probably far too early to be talking about her legacy. She's only just got her foot through the door of number 10. But I don't think she wants her administration to be purely about Brexit. Now, that is, I'm sure, 
pretty much wishful thinking. It's all anyone cares about at the moment. But she is making very tangible effort to make a difference in other areas. And at the moment, she can't tell us much about Brexit, or rather she doesn't want to tell us much about what she's doing behind the scenes to pave the way for us to leave the EU. But what she can do is fill that void with headlines about executive pay, which go down very well in large segments in of the, the press. Well, they also actually, by the way, go down quite well in the Daily Mail, the paper that I work for. Right. Um, you know, there are a, a lot of people who have found Sir Philip Green, to use that example again, uh, as a, a sort of incredibly distasteful uh, lesson in what can go wrong and quite favour intervention in that way. But you're right that mm. her legacy is going to stand or fall on how well she enacts Brexit. You voted Brexit, I voted Brexit. We were among the few, the happy few, that, that, that worked for Brexit all along. I'm worried, aren't you? Do you know, in recent... I'd say in the last week to 10 days, and I spend all day, every day, it seems, talking to politicians on all sides of the argument, I have just begun to sense a creeping unease amongst Brexiteers as to whether or not this is going to work out. Now, it pains me to acknowledge that because I've spent the last few months stridently defending what we voted for, what we believe in, uh, and what I still wholeheartedly believe can be an enormous success. My concern is that this vacuum that's been created very deliberately by Theresa May for some good reasons, the vacuum that she's created by saying I'm not giving a running commentary on what's happening and I'm not triggering Article 50, the, the formal letter Uh, being sent to Brussels that says we're going I'm not going to do that until next year by creating that information gap uh, she's actually given uh, opponents of Brexit and they are very organized uh, uh, some very useful space and time to marshal themselves and cook up ways to try to derail this And she is also allowing other people to shape the narrative. Like? So we have at the moment uh, an awful lot of noise being created by people like Tony Blair coming back onto the scene to complain about the outcome. We've got John Major, the former Conservative Prime Minister, wading in, talking about the need for people to have a say on the terms of the deal. There's a fundamental problem here about around this narrative of a second referendum, this push on the part of Remainers for voters to be given another chance to say whether they like the terms of any deal that Theresa May negotiates. What they're unable to say is, let's suppose we go down this line and have a a second referendum on whatever Theresa May has negotiated. Well, first of all, in order to actually carry out her negotiation as she's rapidly learning she has to trigger Article 50. So that's the letter that says we're off. So let's say we get a year and a half down the line and she's come up with some kind of deal. And that deal is now put to the people. What happens if people say, actually, we don't like the deal? Where does that leave us? That leaves us still leaving the EU because Article 50 is irreversible. So what are they going to say on this referendum paper? And actually, it's completely against what they want because if people in that second referendum, vote against to reject the deal that Theresa May has negotiated, the default position will still be for us to come out of Europe with no deal at all. Well, is that such a bad thing? I mean, do we even want to be in the single market? Look, which has been look, oversold. I, I'm, I am pretty happy with us coming out with, you know, I, I framed it very generally saying no deal at all. We can do a unilateral free trade. I'm very comfortable with that. I, You know, the single market, I think, is it's sort of presented to to people as if it's a bit like a kind of rather benign supermarket. Most people don't really know what the single market is and completely understandably they don't know it. These things are incredibly complicated. So what they imagine it to be 
is you know like a giant Sainsbury's or something. Or a Waitrose, I think actually they've, they've been the it's been version. so oversold. It is the most fantastic supermarket. In, it's probably Fortnum and Masons, in fact. Okay, so they can't really imagine you know being outside. It means you're just sort of outside you're the in door, the cold. looking in, looking in at those shelves and shelves of wonderful cured meats yeah. and wishing that you were inside. Whereas actually. Being outside, well, hey, what, you know, there's not just uh, Aldi and Lidl down the road, but there's also, I don't know, Marks and Spencer, pretty nice food there too. And we're perfectly capable of going along to Marks and Spencer and doing doing our own deals there. Yeah, exactly. So um, we're, we're in danger of having the whole project hijacked by some really very organised people. And, and what we're seeing, surely, is a, an entrenched establishment trying to protect its own, trying to protect itself. So you've got the... The lawyers, the judges of the Supreme Court, all of whom are pretty much um, anti-Brexit. You've got various ex-prime ministers um, and ex-deputy prime ministers, Tony Blair, John Major, Nick Clegg and so on. You've got, you've still got the city, I think is generally anti and coming up with all the stuff about passporting rights as though this is going to change everything. And, and, and it's not. So we're being sold the narrative by a very powerful um articulate establishment these and are nothing very empowered people and what's going on here is for a few days after the referendum outcome these people were all in a state of total shock i mean there was in british politics a sort of three weeks of utter madness and mayhem i mean my memory of that is literally running across college green which is the area opposite the houses of parliament where all the media were camped out and you know these media organizations had only expected to be there for 24 hours they'd book their facilities for short periods thinking that there was not going to be a brexit outcome and i remember having to literally run from one television studio to another with a lot of other presenters and reporters running with me to get to the next bit of the breaking story you know you if you weren't in the UK at that time and if you weren't working around Westminster, it's hard to convey the kind of high, the kind of absolute seismic shock that there was as one story followed another, whether it was, you know, the, the, at the same time, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, was facing a, a, a huge um, a leadership plot and we had... You know, David Cameron's shock resignation. There was the sudden disappearance of the Chancellor, George Osborne, who just basically vanished at the key moment following the Brexit vote. So there was the where's George narrative. And then after Cameron resigned, there was the whole who's going to be next and the whole drama over Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, the two uh, who were supposed to be working together, Boris being the favourite, and then George, uh, then Michael Gove knifed him. I mean, this no one has ever seen anything like this recently. Good times to be a political journalist. Oh, it was great. Although, you know what? We were virtually begging for mercy after two weeks of this. <laughs> yes. You know, I've never in my life actually wanted there to be less stories, and it got to that point. But the, what, the point that I'm trying to make is that for Remainers, they were in such shock at the outcome and then at the extraordinary succession of events that the outcome triggered in politics that they couldn't quite do anything for a bit. But after the dust settled, they suddenly realised, actually, you know what? Show's not over. Yeah. You know, we can actually, maybe we can derail this. And these are empowered people. They have powerful sections of the media on their side. Fortunately, those sections of the media, and it was, I think, the small majority of the media, and I'm thinking about print, print newspapers here, that favoured uh, Brexit have stood firm. But there are, you know, the papers like The Times and the FT, who are vehemently uh, opposed to what they like to paint as hard Brexit. And perhaps we'll come to talking about this term hard Brexit, which is a really insidious term, by the way. That's a piece of propaganda. Totally. Tell us about that. Well, so what is hard Brexit? Hard Brexit is a characterisation of how uh, Leave shows it how leave plays out it's a characterization by the remainers which is deliberately designed to make brexit sound scary nasty the word hard hard is not a soft word by definition and it's designed to frighten people this is a continuation of project fear it is the ultimate expression of project fear 
And it's very effective and it does worry me. And wherever I can, I try to make the point, you know, my little voice heard here or there as I pop up on television programmes and hopefully other people make the same point, that there is no such thing as hard Brexit. There's just, or soft Brexit, there's just authentic Brexit, real Brexit. Anything else is a sellout, it's synthetic Brexit. But it's the BBC doing this mainly, isn't it? The, the BBC was on to the hard... Because I, I, I looked up hard and soft Brexit and I traced it back to really, um, I think in July after the referendum, the BBC was talking about it then and they promulgated this, this narrative. I know that there's a there's a popular theme amongst uh, real right wingers like you uh, that likes to have a go at the BBC. And I think actually during the referendum campaign, they were really meticulously even handed. They were, they were appalling. Do you know what? Even the Daily Mail and the Daily Mail uh, really holds the BBC's feet to the fire. You know, we're constantly having a go at the BBC quite rightfully over its bias. But actually, we repeatedly acknowledged during the referendum campaign that they were being, they were being studiously fair and impartial. So I don't know in terms of what's happened since the referendum campaign because I haven't been monitoring so closely how the BBC has been reporting things. But, you know, they report the news as it is generated by lobby lobby groups. And when I say lobby groups, I mean very loosely that enormous gang of metropolitan elite and people who have a self-interest in keeping the status quo. I never see this. I, I, I never see how, how lobby groups set the agenda. But I, I was reading the, the Tim Shipman book on, on, the, on, mm. on how the uh, election cycle, well, well, how the referendum campaign cycle worked. And I, I had no idea the degree to which the political day is controlled by various lobbyists and strategists feeding snippets of information. Well, it, you know, it's uh, an interesting thing how that works. And actually, the uh, I... I was involved in writing a, a, a co-authoring or rather I, I edited a book for one of the other key players on the leave side Aaron Banks and they Aaron ran a uh, is a, a very successful businessman who ran a kind of guerrilla uh, campaign for Brexit alongside the official campaign and it was a kind of anti-politician campaign really although it came to involve a number of politicians most notably Nigel Farage But Aaron Banks made real capital out of not playing that game, out of not sort of putting out your press release precisely timed to get onto the one o'clock World at One news bulletin on Radio 4 and not having a kind of meticulous media grid that says, right, we need to put this picture out then because that just gets them excited just before the 10 o'clock news and all of that. And what he showed is it's perfectly possible to run as effective a campaign on social media that has absolutely nothing to do with the way traditionally the media and the Westminster lobby in particular has uh, filed their stories to dominate the headlines. And isn't it interesting that, that, that Donald Trump appears to be using social media, using Twitter to announce, to, to bypass that, that whole process as well? And will it all end in tears? You know, it's a, it, this is experimental. This is a new type of politics. And maybe it's the future or maybe it will be proven to be just too edgy and too dangerous. Well, let's talk about that in the next section. You are listening to Delling Poll on Podcast One. My name is Anthony Ponce and I used to be a reporter on NBC. But I got tired of being part of traditional news media, so I quit that job and became a Lyft driver. And now I interview whatever passengers end up in my back seat. So if you want to hear the best stories that real people tell me when we're driving around the city, check out my podcast. It's called Backseat Rider on PodcastOne.com, the Podcast One app, and iTunes. This is Delling Pole, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Dellingpole. You are listening to Dellingpole on Podcast One. Welcome back to my special guest, Isabel Oakshot. And we've got to talk about 
Nigel Farage and Donald Trump and what's going to happen next. Now, I don't know about you, I was rather excited about when Donald Trump won. I thought, I thought, lols, mega lols, in fact, if nothing else. I, I so enjoy the wailing of, of, of the, the same people who wailed about Brexit. Are, are, you a, are you a fan? I found this quite difficult, actually, because the naughty reporter in me always wants, always votes for maximum disruption. You know, that's a kind of the journalistic instinct is to want the most, the biggest story, the biggest upset, the most exciting outcome. So the journalist in me always loved the Donald Trump story. You know, this tale of someone who was considered an absolute clown. I'm sure he's still considered a complete clown by most uh, of his critics. And then uh, sort of <clears throat> from being an, a rank outsider has managed to get himself into the most powerful position in the world, arguably. And so I liked all of that. Um, but I did feel uncomfortable about the uh, revelations over his... It's a very sweeping way of expressing it, but over his attitude to women. And I remember being on Question Time our kind of flagship BBC One uh, political debate on television. And um, I was on Question Time, I think the week or the week of the revelations about Donald Trump and his, that that's very embarrassing snip uh, of video from, from several yeah. years ago. And I just felt I couldn't defend that, actually. I found that uh, it's pretty grubby and it's not what you know if you're asked is this the sort of thing quality you want in a statesman uh, then it's very hard to say well yes that is the sort of quality <laughs> I want from a statesman so I was a bit uncomfortable about about all of that um, but I you know I reserve judgment and see how he works out I think he'll be you know we've already seen that he's perfectly capable of making very counterintuitive appointments in the person that he's chosen for his education secretary for example uh, and you know I you only have to look at someone like Louise Mensch who uh, was an MP here now based over I think she's based in New York who was absolutely vehemently uh, anti-Trump and you know pro-Hillary all the way, all the way, all the way, and is now saying, well, actually, you know, Trump might not be that. But this, bad. this, if, if you're old enough to remember, <clears throat> I'm sure you're not old enough to remember Ronald Reagan. I remember vividly when he got elected. There was so much stuff about how this dumb cowboy, this actor, what qualifications did he have to be president of the USA? And of course, now he's looked back on as one of the great presidents. I think it's possible that this will happen to Trump. I think people are, sensible people are coming round. I mean, some of us were sensible all along. Some of us knew he was the the man. Mm. But I think people are going to be very pleasantly surprised. Now, tell us about Nigel, Nigel Farage and his relationship with Trump. I love talking about Nigel Farage because he is one of my favourite politicians. And this is not always an easy place to be as a political reporter, uh, saying that you're a fan of Nigel Farage. It doesn't earn you many friends or influence people. Um, But I've known Nigel for many years. I've followed his career with a great deal of interest. And I'm one of the few political reporters that have taken him really seriously and persistently defended him against entirely fabricated uh, allegations of that he's a racist and I mean that does make my blood boil because the Nigel Farage I know is not a racist he is a man who has campaigned against unfettered immigration that is not the same as being a racist I think he's an extraordinary politician he has devoted a quarter of a century to campaigning for Britain to leave the EU at immense personal cost And it never ceases to amaze and dismay me how bitterly ungrateful so many of the commentariat are for the extraordinary role that he has played in public life. This is a man, by the way, who still hasn't had any kind of peerage or honour for the work and in recognition of the work he's done uh, for uh, in the interests of this country. And, you know, whether or not you voted for Brexit, you surely ought to be able to acknowledge that it was a result of his efforts that David Cameron was pushed into a position where he had to offer us a referendum. And not many people would say it wasn't a good thing that we had our say. So you can, at the very least, acknowledge Nigel Farage's 
um, impressive role in that capacity. And yet there he is. He, unlike uh, a number of the key players, many of them utter non-entities, by the way, who ended up with showered with honours and uh, badges of achievement from David Cameron when he left office. Nigel Farage still is just Nigel Farage. And I think that's an absolute travesty. He's, I agree, he has got to be Lord Farage. He's He's surely the most significant politician in Britain since Margaret Thatcher, the one whose, whose legacy will last longest. In my opinion, yes. Uh, I don't think he'd want to be Lord Farage, actually. I think he'd quite like to be Sir Nigel. Sir Nigel. Yeah. Well, that would do. The thing about being a peer is it limits what you can do. And I think that Nigel very much now sees his role on the international stage. And it's no good if you're a peer gadding around America and spending large portion of your time out there and it also limits what you can do in a business capacity and I think that Nigel quite rightly and understandably feels it's time for him to earn some money now. Yeah well absolutely he's been earning <clears throat> peanuts up until now. How about a baronetcy? That would be good wouldn't it? I, I think he's only got daughters so they, they, they wouldn't be, he wouldn't be able no, to pass on. No I, I can tell you because I met them last week he has two lovely sons oh, does he? in their 20s. So yes. he should have in that case he, he should be, be made a baronet. But you know this is wishful thinking it's not going to happen. I do think he'll get something uh, I hope it's a, a knighthood but it, it seems to me inconceivable that that will happen very swiftly. I had thought that he'd get something in the New Year's Honours, but I'm told that that is not in, in the offing. So still... why is Theresa May, surely this reflects very badly on her, why is she being so so mean and grudging towards, towards Farage? It doesn't reflect well on her character. Well, first of all, I am going to briefly stand up for Theresa May on this. Nigel Farage doesn't help himself often. You know, I was at uh, an awards dinner a few weeks ago thrown by The Spectator magazine. I don't think you were there, were you? Uh, were NFI. You, were you not I never get invited? effing well invited for some reason. Spectator, please bloody listen if you listen to this podcast. Yeah, carry on. Right. So Nigel was there. It was an award ceremony. It's called Parliamentary, Parliamentarian of there. the Year. It was actually a really sensational evening. Thanks. And yeah, sorry about that. Um, and there were some fantastic speeches, and the whole thing was absolutely kind of broiling with um, scores to be settled and rivalries. I and mean, I've been to this event on a number of occasions, and I've never seen anything like it. You know, this was bringing together a lot of people who has fallen out or you know whose careers have been shattered in the last few months and they all found themselves having to kind of share a share a sort of small room together and uh, were barely able to keep their um diplomatic hats on and um there were some very very funny and gracious and sort of self-deprecating speeches from uh, from a number of the key participants that evening and one person who did not give such a speech was Nigel Farage who won parliamentarian of the year or like i think he won lifetime achievement actually he won one of the big awards and his acceptance speech in my view set the wrong tone he was speaking to an audience i would have said probably predominantly brexiteer audience this is a spectator supported brexit uh they were the hosts after all and he really only has one mode at the moment, Nigel, and I say this with affection. And it's a kind of, you press the button and off he goes, he delivers the same pugilistic, confrontational speech in which it's Nigel Farage and his supporters, us against the world. And that set the wrong tone. And when he does that, uh, when he's in the in the bosom of the establishment, which is not a place he likes to be, admittedly, I think that unnecessarily alienates people. So there was an opportunity where he could have said something nice to Teresa. He could have said something gracious about her determination to deliver Brexit, even though she hadn't backed the campaign. He could have begun to build some bridges and that opportunity was spectacularly lost because he just came in and did what Nigel does, delivered his it's me against the world speech, we're winning, this is a shock, you can all expect more shocks, yep. and then swept off again. Right. And I think that he's just got into that mode of deliver delivering the same tone of speech all the time. Because he's probably been... <clears throat> we, we, you and I have been there. When people are consistently being horrible to you yes. and you're on the back foot, you get you can't help becoming defensive 
couldn't agree more. And you know, the guy has had a really rough time. There was a story on the front of one of the newspapers last weekend where he said he fears assassination. And I know that's true. He does fear assassination. You know, he... uh, Why do you think he's so excited and eager to be in America? Because it's very different over there. Over there, he's adulated. It's extraordinary. I have been in America with Nigel on trips... Uh, to the Republican convention uh, earlier this year and was just so stunned by the level of recognition he has out there and by the endless stream of people of all walks of life wanting to take photographs with them, selfies, because there's Mr Brexit, Nigel Farage. Well, you know, they love him out there. Why wouldn't you want to move out there? Because here he gets so much grief. And also, he's besties of the new president of the USA. I mean, how, how is that going to work out? Do, he's obviously not going to get the, the DC ambassadorship, but what, what do you think might nice happen? Nice mischief, though, wasn't it, of Trump to tweet that suggestion? And, you know, don't make the mistake of thinking that Trump just sort of did this off the cuff. This was war games. You know, this was absolutely... Trolling. Uh, uh, let, let's just sort of wind up Theresa May. Let's see how this plays out. And, you know, they thought about... I know that his advisors thought through the possible repercussions of such a tweet and then thought, sod it, we'll do it anyway. <laughs> Of course, they didn't think that she was going to say, oh, OK, then, you know, Mr. Trump suggested that we should put Farage in this position. All right, then we'll just follow those ideas. But he was sending a message out, wasn't he? And, and a very powerful message it was, too. And, you know, I think the debate has been unnecessarily dominated by will Nigel Farage or won't he get the ambassadorship? Of course, we can say he will absolutely not get it, but he already has a role. You know, the whole thing about will Theresa give Nigel a job? He's got one. It just doesn't have a name. Yeah. Well, I think we are entering much happier times in terms of our relationship with, with America. We didn't really have a special relationship with... We with, really didn't. With, with back, back of the queue. Back, back of the queue and all that fakery about, what, eating a hamburger with, oh, with, with Dave. With, with a fawning Dave groan. at that match. Yeah. Um, now we genuinely have a, a US president who actually likes us. He likes us, uh, but I can't see him ever having a meeting of minds with Theresa May, can you? And I think, no. it's, excuse me, I think it's a real problem there. You know, He's not going to she... go riding like, like um, well, actually, no, the, the Queen did with Ronald Reagan, didn't she? It wasn't Margaret It's Thatcher. just really hard to see how you could ever get any kind of chemistry between those two. No. I mean, it's hard to get chemistry with Theresa May, whoever you are. She is quite a cold fish. Uh, and she... if, if we tried grabbing her pussy... It, 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 it oh, would crikey, be... Jamie. Now you've given me a, a mental image <laughs> sorry. that I, I just... Do you I'm know sorry. what? Every podcast... Every that podcast... Was un- I, record, that was unacceptable. I, go, like I, I, I suddenly go bad. But it was Trump's. It was, it was, that's what Trump said. It, I didn't say you've, it. You've gone off the reservation. And I, as I said earlier, I thought that language was pretty revolting, yes, actually. Yes, exactly. You're in my so, bad books now. <laughs> how can I get back before the, before the podcast? And otherwise, back I'm going to... Back onto the motorway, down the straight and okay, narrow. Okay, okay. Onto something uh, easier territory. Okay. Um, oh, I've left him all flustered. Yeah, I, I hate being told off by, by girls. My, my mother's telling me off. My daughter always tells me off. And my wife always tells me off. And now you're telling me off. Well, you know, you have to behave better then won't you oh, dear. oh well I think we're going to end the podcast there we're going to go and have some lunch aren't we and you're still my friend uh, I think we're still friends who's buying lunch oh uh, well Looks after like that it's going to be you alright <laughs> well that's all this week from Delling Poll on podcast one with my special guest Isabel Oakshot thank you my dear dear friend thank you so much for listening and look if you can spare the time to give me a five star review on iTunes. I really, really appreciate it. Lots of love. Till next week. Bye.